<coughs> you may not be able to read everything uh, perfectly there. Anyway, the, t the talk I prepared may seem too similar to what uh, Jalar just, uh, just uh, told you, but I want to give the, a different point of view. Well, uh, here it comes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to admit uh, that uh, due to technical problems, this is not free software. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to have problems. It's able to make me make much, better, much better quality, but then you couldn't record it on video, so that's the reason we are using this S video cable here. Okay, well, not to worry, Let, let's get started. Uh, the, the problem here is the lack of free hardware. Yeah. Not that the should have been here is not here, apparently, so. Uh. <laughs> okay, uh, well, so, uh, what. <laughs> Se le puede quitar el. This machine likes to, to go to sleep. But anyway. Uh, After 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, what I want to talk about is uh, why this is more a social movement than a technical one. I mean, the result we see of free software is that, uh, uh, that we have a technically superior uh, system for technical users and, well, each time more for all kinds of users, but... Okay, I want my presentation. <laughs> okay, I like starting with definitions. So, uh, what, uh, what is free software? Well, uh, in order to understand that, we need to talk about what software, yeah? Software is knowledge, is the a serial, I mean any program is just a series of steps you need to take from a known starting point to a known desired ending point, yes? And well, yes, the relations may be uh, too complex and it's not just one, one algorithm or one set of algorithms. A program is much more complex, but it can be reduced to a series of algorithms pasted together with some user interaction, yes? So software is knowledge. Is how to is knowing how to move between a, a, a starting and an ending point. A knowledge is information, and information is science. Yeah. So what I'm talking here is that software is like science. So uh, software uh, production has been uh, shifted from being a production of knowledge to to becoming production of a commercial product, and that's what I think. Uh, has got us uh, to the wrong direction, yeah? So, uh, let, let's first uh, assume that soft, uh, writing software is like writing science. We are different groups specialized in thinking uh, in our ways, but anyway. Now, about freedom. Let's talk only, not, not only about uh, a, a software product or a program, or but here we're talking about societies, we're talking about even living organisms. Freedom is autodetermination. If I am a free person, I know that I can leave you here and nobody will come with the police after me. Yes? Uh, well, maybe so, but. Yeah. Uh, uh, as a program th that has autodetermination uh, may, may, uh, may grow the way it wants to grow. Yes? And, uh, and uh, it will lead to evolution. Remember what is evolution? Uh, arbitrary changes enter a species, and the best changes survive. So my program may be forked. I mean, two people may take my program and may make it grow in different uh, directions. So we have in the end two different programs that compete with each other or that collaborate with each other. Uh, uh, and, and that's not bad. And well, maybe one of them will die on the way uh, forward, but but maybe both will survive. And well, that's natural <coughs> selection. Yep. And cross, -poli cross pollinization means we have multiple sources of uh, a, of uh, new information coming into a program. I mean, or into a project or anything. For example, we at uh, Debian, well, we know what we're doing. Uh, trust me. 
really. <laughs> but uh, but we still we, we get information from other projects. I mean, there's not much I may say that, that I like about Fedora, but we may learn something from them. For example, giving a coherent experience to the end user brings more users in. So if we want more users in, maybe we want to have a coherent uh, uh, view for them. Yeah. Different projects will learn for, for, uh, from each other. And of course, science has always been like this. Science has always been free. Yep. Up to 50 years ago, the scientific process, well, it was uh, simple. And a scientist or a group of scientists researches on a subject. Which subject? Well, either some, something he cares about, if he, like, uh, say, uh, Socrates has the resources to, uh, I mean, he comes from a good family and has money, or uh, he got it from, a, I don't know how to translate to English, but I understand the word is similar in many languages, uh, mecenas, uh, a sponsor, so someone, there's a, someone who's not a scientist, but this is interested in, in getting more knowledge uh, processed, yeah? Or maybe he's working for an institution like most people are today in a university. Yeah. Or maybe for a monarch. Many monarchs uh, sponsored uh, uh, science through the, through the time. Yep. And well, <coughs> he works on this project for a couple of years. Then he delivers the project. And he's paid for the time he invested. I mean, he's not just working for free. Or if he is, well, it's his right also. <coughs> but whatever he publishes becomes the property of everybody, the property of mankind. Anybody can now build on what was discovered 3,000 years ago. Yeah? Uh, of course, if I want to build over somebody's work, I have to credit him. I have to say, well, uh, uh, thanks for uh, Aristoteles for discovering that uh, volumes in water uh, move the liquid out and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, well, uh, Isaac Newton said uh, this phrase that is very appropriate to, to what we're doing now. We're, uh, it's not that I'm a very tall man. Yeah, It's not that I see farther than any of you. It's that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. And by saying that, well, he become part of the giant as well. So we're growing. <coughs> But <coughs> what, <coughs> sorry, I have a bit of sore throat. Uh, 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 why uh, am I saying that it, this happened until more or less 50 years ago? Well, first, because of corporativism. Uh, big corporations, big companies now have too much power. Yep. They have enough power to buy governments, to change uh, laws, to push the, the, the direction of uh, mankind. <coughs> Hot burning coffee. <laughs> mm, to push the the development of mankind into something that just generates more money for them. Yep. Now we have laws such as the patent law or the copyright law, which were originally created to help the lonely inventor uh, be able to stand up to the big corporations uh, and not have a big disadvantage with them. But they have been twisted and perverted and, well, now uh, both laws are against the lone inventor and work for the, the big companies. Yeah. We had a transition of the patenting process to the absurd. Yep. Patenting process is, well, a patent is a a uh, legal monopoly given to uh, the inventor of something. I mean, if I make up a way of drinking coffee uh, without burning my throat, okay, then I can sell it to you. But, of course, it, it will probably be uh, some kind of apparatus, some, some uh, mechanical artifact that covers my throat and gets it uh, down to my stomach. <laughs> so I will burn, but I will notice. Uh, but, of course, I have only limited resources. I have two hands and no money. If you have a big company, then you will start mass producing them and drive me out of business. Then I can get a patent. The patent uh, uh, allows me to charge you if I want to, uh, to, uh, to give you permission to, to use it. But uh, in the beginning, it was a good idea maybe 400 years ago. 
but it has uh, uh, become stupid. For example, uh, uh, the USPTO uh, 5960411 granted to Perry Hartman and the other people say that it, it, it granted them uh, in year 2000 a patent to buy over a communications network. Well, first, I have bought over communications networks, I mean over uh, internet speci specifically, since 96 or 97. So this patent must not, uh, should not have been awarded as, as it's uh, uh, there's uh, prior art. Other people have done that. Uh, second, it's too broad. I mean, maybe in 1980 something, I bought a pizza over the phone. That's a communications network. Maybe I took a bus to to the store and bought something there. I used the communications network as well there. Yep. Uh, John Keogh was awarded uh, in 2001, if I'm not wrong, a patent for a circular device and apparatus for the facilitation of transport. Yeah. In Australia, you must pay him if you want to use a wheel. <laughs> <laughs> in Mexico, we have a, a popular dish called cochinita pibil. It's uh, very, very good. I would like to suggest you to trying it. But since 1993, the process for making cochinita pibil is patented as well. Mm. And well, it's not that uh, they're granting the patents to the first inventor who comes around and gives it, but we now have companies who devote all the time, uh, uh, that only exist to manage a portfolio of uh, patents, so they can charge others. And there are companies that only hire lawyers, and well, I happen to have some lawyer friends, but other than that, uh, we often regard them as the lowest life form we can find. And well, we have that, uh, so many patents nowadays that it's impossible to research uh, them all where, uh, while uh, working on, on a project. We have millions of them. And I can assure you, any project breaks many patents. Well, I'm more or less <coughs> skipping the explanation here. Uh, copyright has become eternal. I mean, uh, copyright was originally for 28 years. Now it's for the natural life term of the person plus 70 years. So <coughs> we cannot just use somebody else's ideas even after he's dead. Uh, and we know all talk about intellectual property. Well, that's a very strange idea that uh, brings together three concepts that, has, that have very little to do with each other. So I suggest you don't use the term uh, intellectual property. Know what you're talking about, because I don't think there can be any intellectual property. I mean, knowledge is, is it doesn't have an owner. OK, so that leads us to the world today. What happens here? Mm, well, science is held hostage. Yep. On one side, well, uh, we are all very happy here because we won a battle, but there's still a lot, of, a lot of work going on in many, many other countries because there's an international discussion regarding if you can patent not a industrial process, but a mathematical one, or a, 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 you, you can patent even an idea, yeah? not even an algorithm, just a, an idea that's on the air. Yeah? Uh, in Europe, uh, so, uh, less than one week ago, in the whole community, well, union now, uh, it's been approved that uh, patents will not be effect effective for non-industrial related ideas. I, I don't have the details yet, someone else will surely explain sh uh, soon. Uh, for example, we, ha we have a very important case. You all remember some years ago, uh, there was a lot of uh, talk about the race to get to the human genome uh, sequencing. We now have the human genome fully sequenced, uh, and well, uh, the, the leader behind the main effort was John Salston from Sanders Center. Yep. But he was not, of course, the only one doing that. He was competing with other teams that wanted to uh, have it uh, differently. <coughs> so one of the other teams was Celera Genomics. Celera Genomics wanted to patent the human genome. So, if they had it their way, and tomorrow I want to have a child, 
I will have to pay them because I'm using their intellectual property, yes? <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, if I patent uh, the result of my research and someone else uh, just translates it into code, well, I am not getting a patent, he is. Because patents are only for tangible works. Yeah. And some, someone said that code is tangible. I still don't know why. But uh, you can patent a program already made. You cannot patent something that's expressed in terms of, uh, well, mathematical language. Well, I'm skipping here a little bit. <coughs> this, this I already talked about. OK. <coughs> so let's get started on our talk. What is free software? Yep. Free software is the software that ke keeps freedom. It's software that, that keeps uh, knowledge characteristics, that, that lets, us lets us claim back knowledge, that lets us continue working, continue developing humanity as, uh, as we did up to 50 years ago. Yep. And well, many of us are in this movement not because we want a superior operating system or because we are techno freaks, we, we're also. Yep. But, but we want freedom, we want uh, uh, mankind to continue advancing, even uh, after w we're gone. And this is the only way to claim it is back. Yep. Now, being concrete, I, I know Jaldar already said, uh, said this, but free software is the software that's, uh, that's assuring us freedom of, of use for any conceivable use, freedom of learning. The only way I can learn how a program is implemented is by looking at its code and uh, understanding each of its parts. Free freedom of improvement, if a program r works wrongly, well, I can uh, make it better. <coughs> freedom of redistri redistribution, I mean, I can share my knowledge with my friends. Yep. Okay, this uh, is completely covered by him. No, no. Actually, could you go back one slide? I have a recommendation. Of course. Um, to I think I can go back a slide. Okay. Yeah to, yeah, to to tie this into your uh, theme of, of science uh, and the way uh, scientific knowledge is disseminated, uh, we can even think of uh, these freedoms as like being freedom to observe, uh, freedom to learn, uh, freedom to experiment, and then the last point, freedom to teach. Yes, very important. Because we don't we don't redistribute just to repeat. Oh, okay, repeat please. Um, to, I was well, going to let one. you tell the people, but... Well, but, but you're the leader. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, because it wasn't uh, video recorded, so... Well, okay. here's Brandon. Okay. Um, I, was, I was just going to make the observation that to, to tie these points in. I mean, we often talk about the, the four freedoms. For those who aren't familiar, these, uh, these freedoms are from the uh, uh, essay by Richard Stallman of the Free Software Foundation. Uh, called uh, entitled something like the four freedoms of free software, and uh, we often speak in terms of these exact uh, verbs. Uh, you know, use, use, uh, learn, improve, and redistribute. Uh, but in 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 Gunnar's theme of scientific knowledge and research and dissemination of learning, I think there's another way to look at it. These are the same activities, but we can think of them as observing. That's that's usage. Uh, experimenting, improvement, uh, and freedom of redistribution would be teaching, which is the counterpart of learning. You learn from reading the source code, uh, but if you can't share your work, you're not able to provide you, the knowledge that you've acquired uh, in a form that is easy for another person to pick up and adapt. So I think there's an educational angle in here with the uh, with the scientific part. And so, sorry, I talked way too long. So let no, me no, no, no. Of course. You. Uh, uh, now. Uh, Going a bit uh, further down Brandon's path, well, yes, uh, we are quite strict on what we consider free software. We demand these four uh, uh, freedoms from everything we are including in Debian. Uh, for example, well, I haven't uh, seen if uh, the new Solaris license, uh, I, I'm not just familiar with it, but I've uh, read through <coughs> Java's license or things like that. Son has a quite ambivalent uh, position regarding free software. They say they, wa they like free software, but it's not exactly free. So that's exla exactly what they don't uh, uh, allow us. They have this thing con called the some community source license. It says, well, once you're a member of the community, I mean, once you accept 
our uh, license, you can learn and share and uh, improve and modify and redistribute to anybody who has also uh, signed to be part of the community. So we cannot just uh, go to an open forum and teach. Yep. So we have thanks. <coughs> okay, this was covered by Jalhar. Okay, well, free software, uh, we actually most of us live off free software. Uh, what we do is free software, that's it. And we charge for it, yep. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's the most natural thing to do. Because, the, uh, as, I, as I told you before, the scientific process is that, that the researcher works on something, then gets paid and publishes, yep. So, well, I also uh, care for my time. My time is also valuable. So if I am developing something, I expect to be paid for it. Even, I can even just get paid for telling, oh, the solution for you is to use Postfix. That's 100 euros. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now a couple of last points. Uh, as a developer, why do I want to to uh, not only to ask, but to uh, to really prefer uh, for my development to a client to be free software. Well, first of all, I know this is a country much more legal and much more organized than what I, uh, where I live in, yeah? But uh, this will make even more sense here. First of all, I want the ability to use the code I've uh, written before in my new developments. Yeah, that will save me uh, development time, that will uh, reduce cost for the client because instead of working for six months redoing what I already did, I'll only work two months adapting it to the current needs. Yeah. So, uh, and if uh, you're not developing software spe uh, 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 explicitly free, then you don't have the right to use what you gave to one client to another one. Okay. Peer review. I can legally give any of you a copy of my code and tell you, well, please, can you help me solve this problem? Because I can share this code with anyone. And the way we all work is by having peer, peer review, by having other people look at our stuff. Uh, usually even peer review means that uh, someone will say, well, what you're doing is al 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 already implemented in this project. Okay? The ability to collaborate with our past works in larger projects? Well, uh, first of all, I want to collaborate in larger projects because I want to uh, help uh, help the project and help the world have a wider knowledge of, uh, uh, of itself. But on the other side, I am also a selfish, uh, selfish person. Yes, so if I contribute to, a, to an important project, I will get recognition. By having more recognition, I will be invited to contribute in larger projects, which will give me more recognition. Yeah. And that will become, well, maybe a DPL. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, <laughs> uh, it also encourages good programming practices. Uh, you know the three main virtues of a programmer. Uh, a, a great programmer is imp impatient, lazy, and, uh, and uh, hubris. I mean, he thinks he's the best. Yep. Uh, this is uh, uh, this was said by Larry Wall, the author of Pearl. Yes, if, if I am, <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I am lazy, well, I, I I don't like writing the things over and over. I want uh, to be able just to copy a block of, of code from one place to another, and it should work. Then. If I am a good programmer, I will isolate my functions so I can just copy them over. But then again, looking through uh, thousands of lines of code, searching for the right function, is also a pain. Yeah. I, I am also quite impatient. So uh, I, I take the work to uh, organize my code in such a way that I can easily find what I'm looking for. Yeah. So I can be impatient. And then the most important point for free software is that I want you all to believe I am great. <laughs> <laughs> so I will write clean code, I will comment <coughs> the lines, I will write documentation, I will invent everything, 
as if I were not writing Perl. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I will make the code so easy to read, you will all think I am a good coder. And by doing that, I will be a good coder. Or what? Well, at least uh, better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, if I am uh, hiring someone to work for me, because not everybody is a programmer, why do I want it to be free software? Yeah. If I am just the, the client. Well, first of all, it guarantees the system can be maintained. I mean, if someone hires me to write a code for them, and then I decide to stay in Finland because the weather is very, very nice here, okay? Uh, well, someone else can take over my code. They don't depend on me. Yeah. It will reduce costs because, uh, because many problems are already solved. As I told you, just search and many of your, the problems you're going to solve are already taken care of. Okay, avoid the dependence on a single provider. This is the creation of development groups and system integration. This means maybe now, I'm a, uh, now I have a small company, but five years from now, this may grow a lot. And I may be hiring 10 people. Maybe the 10 people I hire for system developing are not experienced developers, but uh, by having them study free software, by having them be able to read the software that was written for me, I will be able to make them into a group and uh, start having interesting results. And of course, that gives uh, recognition and publicity to my company. Just, uh, well, I don't have the list of sponsors here, but uh, spons sponsoring something like this, even if it's just by having people come over the, uh, to DevConf, yep, gives recognition to a company, and that's something that they say that matters in the, the real world. Okay? So, well, just as conclusions, free software is a radical departure from the knowledge production systems we have grown used to in the last decades. Yep. It's nothing new. It leads us back to development as it had always been before this. It challenges the relation between knowledge producers and knowledge consumers, as we are all the same now. Yep. And finally, even if you don't want to, free software will get you. <laughs> So, well, uh, I think we're a bit uh, short on time, so I don't know if I should display this, but uh, I can be reached at gmall at debian.org, and if you can read more or less, I will put the, the slides in that uh, address somewhere during the next uh, couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're lazy, but we're impatient. <laughs> But I am better. But your hubris will win out and you'll put the slides up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So maybe one or two questions. Sorry? You can take maybe one or two questions. Okay, so I can take maybe one or two questions, I suppose depending on the length of them. Right. Is there any question? Come on, I can take one or two. <laughs> okay. I have another comment, but I don't want to dominate these things, so if somebody has questions, please take them. Well, if no one uh, asks a question, Brandon will. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do, I do that at work, too. So. Um, w w one thing that I noticed, uh, or, or that just occurred to me on one of your last slides, was the, the, the fact of um, basically open sourcing consulting work. I think it has, uh, I think there's a bit of a double-edged sword to it, but the, the good edge is that, in a way, I think it encourages what I, I'm going to boldly call a virtuous behavior. In other words, it, it, by open sourcing the work that we do for a given consulting client, um, it keeps us from being lazy in a bad way and just uh, trying to fit all solutions into the, or, or keep fitting the, every different peg into the same hole. Uh, we, we don't keep reusing the same tool, and instead we properly customize for each client. Because while we can use the same fundamentals, in practice, uh, most consulting jobs are highly specific in nature. At least that's my, been my experience of progeny. And if we open source the stuff that we do, um, it encourages reuse in the good ways, but it also probably keeps us from, uh, or I think it keeps us from falling into a trap of, of, of being bulky or resistant to the customer's needs because we really just want to reuse this thing that we had five years ago. It's a black box. We'll tell the customer, oh, it can't be done. Just pay me my $50,000 for this undocumented source code. Um, and, and it's important for progress, as you talk about. It's important for scientific progress to keep thinking, keep working, keep attacking problems and coming up with new things instead of just extracting economic rent on old things. 
So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if everybody got to hear it. Uh, but yes, I, I agree with what uh, he says. I mean, uh, we have to be lazy, but in a good way. Uh, we have to take care of our code. We have to be able. One, one very important uh, uh, characteristic of uh, free software is that it doesn't matter if five people implement the same thing in a different way and four people's work of uh, months gets uh, thrown away. Yet we have to be ready to throw our, co our, co our code away if there's a better solution or if our code has grown old and uh, full of uh, quirks and unmaintainable. It's uh, very important to be able to recognize that and not only for free software, just to, for programming in general. So, well, I'm leaving because Igar seems to be getting mad as he's not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> A good talk. Thanks. Thanks.